I am thrilled to introduce our panelists that all have a wealth of experience in this area. And I'm just going to briefly uh, introduce them to you. There's uh, Dr. Laura Abrams. She's a professor and chair of social welfare at the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. And her scholarship has critically examined experiences of youth in the U.S. justice system uh, through reentry and the transition to adulthood. And she's currently pursuing research in the area of youth justice policy and comparative studies on the age of criminal responsibility and the law. Uh, next, uh, she often works with Dr. Elizabeth Barnard, uh, also from UCLA. Dr. Barnard is an assistant professor of pediatrics at UCLA, and she provides pediatric care to youth in the juvenile justice system. She's a board certified pediatrician and her research focuses on the intersection between youth incarceration and health. Next is Kent Mendoza Morales. Uh, Kent is an organizer, activist, motivational speaker, and the manager of advocacy and community organizing at the Anti-Recidivism Coalition or ARC in Los Angeles. Uh, and ARC is a member of NJJN. Prior to working at ARC, Kent spent five years incarcerated before getting out in 2014 and working for the LA Area Chamber of Commerce on youth justice and work development issues. And he is a member of LA County's Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council and the governor appointee of California State Advisory Committee or SAG on Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention. Uh, next, we have Brett Peterson. Brett is the director of the Utah Division of Juvenile Justice Services. And so he is responsible for the operation and management of their continuum of care. And as director, uh, Brett is committed to reducing the need for out-of-home placements and correlating the services they provide with the leading research related to adolescent brain development and the ongoing implementation of significant juvenile justice reforms. And last but not least is Pamela Vickery. Um, uh, Pam serves as the executive director of the Utah Juvenile Defender Attorneys, as well as the Utah Juvenile Defender Resource Center. And um, that she is also, their organization is also a member of NGJN. Pam has been instrumental in many sweeping reforms in Utah, including their recent legislation raising their age of jurisdiction to 12, uh, as well as um, uh, bills on termination, uh, excuse me, on shackling reform, eliminating juvenile life without parole, and many other issues. So uh, welcome to all of you. And I'm going to uh, set the stage by just going through some introductory uh, materials. So let me share my screen. Great. Uh, so uh, just briefly, NJJN, excuse me. Uh, leads a national movement of 54 state-based community advocacy organizations and many individuals across 43 states and D.C. And we're working to shrink the country's youth justice systems and to pursue anti-racist youth justice transformation. Uh, what we are talking today about is um, state laws on the minimum age of jurisdiction and how to uh, raise them. And when we say minimum age of jurisdiction, what I mean is the age at which you can uh, prosecute, charge, and try a child in juvenile courts. As you can see, this gives you, the chart gives you the distribution throughout the country. And uh, slightly less than half the states have a minimum age at all. Um, only three states have an age as high as 12, which is fairly recent, California, Massachusetts, and Utah. Uh, Nebraska has uh, their age at 11, and then the largest number have set their age at 10. Um, you'll see the minimum age starts as low as just six years old in North Carolina, though they are currently working on trying to raise that. And there are uh, many states right now working on raising the minimum age. So um, that's really great news. You see we've counted at least 16 here that are working on this issue of either raising the age for jurisdiction or for confinement. 
And recently there was a win in Mississippi uh, where they passed a bill and raised the minimum age of commitment uh, to 12. And again, you'll see um, geographically and it's very diverse throughout the country All in terms right, of the states that are working on this. Uh, the international standards, uh, just so you're aware, are much higher than they are in this country. So the median age worldwide is 12. The average age in Europe is 13. And the UN uh, Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, which monitors the implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, recently encouraged nations uh, recommended to increase the minimum age of criminal responsibility to at least 14 year, years old, with no exceptions carved out. So based on that international standard, uh, we also recommend that the age be no, low, low, no lower than 14 years old. And for further details, I put a link into our policy platform, which gives a lot more of our rationale. Uh, we've also, uh, together um, with Dr. Barnard and Dr. Abrams, have started a, a national coalition to work on raising the minimum age. And you are welcome to join us. If that's something you'd like to do, please uh, email me directly. Okay, so, all right. So I'm going to uh, get to our questions now for our panelists. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me just, all right, a little technical difficulty here. Okay, that's okay. I will pull this up on my phone. All right. So the course, first question I have is, um, and this is to uh, any of the panelists, if a state has no law or very low um, law for the minimum age, what does that mean in terms of a young child who might be perceived to commit an offense? What can happen to them if there is no uh, minimum age law? Hey, any, any of the panelists? Sure. Okay. I'll jump in from from my perspective. Um, so I, you know, I uh, in my role, I don't I don't often get to be able to see and be with the youth. I go out to our facilities as much as possible. Um, but I remember very vividly an experience where I was in one of our facilities and we were having some type of staff meeting, and my facility director he had to leave, and and I walked out in the hallway and I see him just kind of in a scramble, you know, looking very stressed. And I said, what's going on? And he's like, you know, I've got an 11 year old that just got brought in. Um, might have been a 10 year old, 10 or 11 year old just brought in, just booked in on some charge. And we go back there and, you know, this, this young girl is there and her feet, you know, her feet don't touch the ground. And we're scrambling to find, you know, some treats and some things to uh, you know, my staff are, are great um, and they're, you know, they get trained in, you know, being trauma informed, but it's, that's not the environment anyone wants for their kid, um, you know, really of any age. Um, so I know that these, these, these lines that we draw on the sand, we know they're, they're just arbitrary to a point. Um, but for me, it just became kind of that um, moral touch point, you know, of this is not the right thing to happen to a kid of this age for them to be sitting in that environment and knowing that she was what she was experiencing was just a significant amount of trauma um and then i know others and i'll i'll let them share on it uh, whether that's in a courtroom or other places so to me that's why it's just fundamentally something that has to be addressed and continue to be championed great thank you and um Kent, I know we've talked about, uh, sometimes people think if, if a young person is arrested, you know, it's, it's not gonna be a big deal and not much will happen to them. But I know you've worked with young people that in fact have been incarcerated for a long time. So if you wanna talk about yeah. that a little. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'll speak, I'm, I'm in California, just for y'all that don't know. Um, uh, when the state legislature passed uh, the bill here in California that basically raised the age to 12, to the age of 12. Uh, it basically what it told, it told youth that they matter. Uh, and, you know, now what this means is that before this law passed, youth age 12, youth who were age of 12 and under were being arrested, put in detention, and ultimately in confinement for things that maybe can be addressed differently. Uh, I say this because I currently have 
probably like around eight interns, eight youth, young men and women who I work with who were incarcerated. And out of those eight, two of them were incarcerated when they were 12, specifically my intern, Sofia Cristo, who was 12 years of age when she was incarcerated for the first time in her lifetime. She ended up doing 10 years from the age of 12. She was released probably like six months ago. Uh, and when she came home, you know, she's already 23 uh, and now doing the work with me. But what uh, this what this law says is like if there was a lot like that in place when she was going through this system of incarceration, she could have been avoided probably spending that time, that long year of incarceration in that system. Because, you know, when you when a youth gets incarcerated at 12, 13 or just 11 at a young age, they are automatically uh, likely to spend more time in these systems. And sometimes, you know, uh, because the system doesn't understand the behaviors or this youth really well, you know, what they do at 11, 12, they criminalize that behavior and that becomes more further into the systems. And now you have kids that if otherwise this law would be in place, you know, can be diverted versus if it wasn't, now you have kids that are for something so small and simple that can be addressed differently. Now we're criminalized that little behavior and that is becoming, slowly is becoming bigger and bigger. And by the time now this kid is turning 12, 13, 14, now he's progressing in the system of incarceration. And now, you know, it just, it gets, uh, it's, that's how we're failing our youth. And I think that this is why it's important that, you know, it, it's that we we have uh, the age raised to uh, more higher because, you know, the youth are just being arrested for things that can be, uh, you know, addressed differently and not just by putting them in a cell or putting them in on probation or putting them in a confinement because those are things that don't really address the issues that a 12 year old kid or 11 year old kid who are still kids who are still a child uh, have to be addressed. So uh, yeah, that's why it's important that, 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 uh, that we raise the age because you know, kids are just gonna fall in the crack and gonna excel in the system and that's what we don't want. Uh, yeah. Excellent, yeah, thank you, Kent. Um, so my next question um, is uh, directed towards Laura, uh, Dr. Abrams and Dr. Barnard about um, some of the research you've done and, and what you've found in terms of how involving children in the justice system at a young age in particular um, is harmful to them. Thanks, Melissa. Um, I'm, I'm gonna share screen now to show you guys some data. Um, give me one second here. Okay. So um, I agree with everything that has been said as a clinician serving kids in juvenile hall, the youngest that I saw was 12 years old. Um, it, it, and, and with what Brett said, it's just not right. And I think it's really important that what Kent said, um, that there is another approach. Um, one thing I just wanna highlight, um, Melissa, you did such a nice job laying out the overview of the issue and you commented that it's really, diverse and sort of random where the where the different minimum age thresholds are set in the country. Um, and one of the things that Laura and I learned when we started doing this work is that before the recent legislative changes in California, Massachusetts, and Utah, um, there hadn't been changes. The, the ages were just set when the justice systems were created. Um, so I think it's really important that we examine the harm to kids and how we can solve this. So with that, um, we, Laura and I set out to take a national look at this issue. And so we did an analysis of a national database that was representative of all kids in the United States. Um, and this was a, using a data set called Ad Health. And we, what we found was that adults who had a history of child incarceration, so first incarceration at a young age, were disproportionately black or Hispanic, male and from lower socioeconomic groups. Um, and that's compared to, also compared to um, people who had their first incarceration as children compared to later adolescent ages. That was a separate study we did. And then we found that there were associations between having a first incarceration as, as a child all the way out to health effects um, in adulthood. And specifically we found worse general health um, having functional limitations, depression, and um, suicidality or wanting to kill yourself. Um, so it's really important. We are talking about young children, and really this is a life course issue um, that likely impacts young people's well-being all the way into adulthood.
I think one other piece to add, um, you know, in addition to the, um, of course, that was the long term effects of incarceration, um, is that what we found in our qualitative research and talking to stakeholders um, in both in uh, California and other states is that for the most part, the young people who come into contact with the law are not necessarily incarcerated. So there's um, there's a, uh, you know, people can dismiss, tend to dismiss this as, well, they don't, they don't get incarcerated. They're five, they're six, they're seven. Um, but the issue is larger than that. It's also about um, how we bring children into the probation system, the surveillance, the sense of, um, of uh, regulation that comes into their lives when they have been handcuffed, put on probation, or even in a formal diversion program. And so even though uh, young children are, you know, highly, un are very uh, much less likely to be incarcerated, we have to think about the whole carceral continuum as being harmful to them in the sense that it's a, the labeling effect, um, the mental health effects and the trauma can continue and then cause future risks for other issues and disruptions. So uh, in our study of California data, for example, uh, the cases of age five to 12 that were arrested um, didn't usually lead to a petition or even incarceration. And, you know, and we'll get to that in a little bit as well about uh, other types of disparities. Okay, thank you. Um, and what are ways uh, that it can harm the community uh, in addition to just the individual child? I could add something, if you don't mind. Sure, uh, yeah. I think there's many ways that this harms our communities. It, it mainly harms black and brown youth and black and brown communities. Those are the most harmed communities by systems of incarceration. Uh, but I think the another thing that it really, that I've seen as someone that, you know, actually spent time incarcerated too. I know that I wasn't 12 or 11 when I was incarcerated, I was 15, but even then that's still a young age. Uh, and and one of the things I remember uh, growing up in my community, seeing that this system really was really in our communities in the, in the way that, you know, growing up, I had all my friends that were just like me. They have no father figures. They have single mothers living in the communities. And one thing that I always saw is that we were all on probation and we all had that relationship that, oh, I have to go see my probation next week. Or, you know, like this, it seemed like the carceral system became part of our cultures as well. Like, you know, like having kids that are 11, 12, have court dates or having to see their PO is like, those were regular things in our communities because that's how the system has really, you know, gotten into our communities, you know, that even us as youth, we don't even know that we're trapped in the system. We're just there, you know, and when we're poor, you have a single mother that doesn't know how to speak English and she's trying to figure out how to live in this country. Like, it's even like, how, how do we expect her to really support me, right? And then the school, so everything, you know, falls in place. But I'm, what I wanted to say is that really the carceral system has really also been become part of our cultures in our communities, you know, in, in a bad way that now we, 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 we have kids there, they're, they're expecting to be on probation or they're expecting to go through these things when it shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't even be in our pictures, in our mind at a young age, but because we have seen it through other people, we expect those things as kids sometimes, you know, being poor and, uh, and not having the opportunities. And that's how it's affecting our communities because now you have kids that are 12, 11, 13 growing up, and unfortunately, they might end up through the systems as well. And I hope they don't, but that's how it's affecting our communities as well. Can I just jump in on that? To, this is Pam. Yeah. Um, Kent, to, I think that that's such a great point because when you look at the community impact, Melissa, um, what, what I see is that the younger the age that you started to look at some of those things, um, the more that you had 
the community not getting involved or not getting involved in a situation or finding alternative methods, right? Everyone starts to just rely on the court system to parent our children or to be the community involvement and the support for our communities and for our young people. So, I mean, when you look at young kids that get referred to court, very often a lot of them are from schools and they're quite frankly, um, frequently special education students that you know maybe teachers find problematic in the classroom. Um, and so schools start to rely on the court system to be the behavior intervention versus finding finding effective um, ways to intervene with young people and to change the way that they're educating um, young kids and doing de-escalation or doing restorative justice type implementation and things like that. And I think that you see the same thing within our communities, right, is that we're going to rely on the court system to handle this. We're going to rely on the court system to um, discipline and do all of these things rather than um, really recognizing that what we need to be doing is providing supports and um, wraparound services to, to young kids that may find themselves in difficult situations. And particularly with young kids, you see the kids that come into the court system, like I said, you'll see um, very, at very young ages, often like special education um, kids, sometimes the interfamilial like um, kids with um, problematic sexual behaviors, but also just things that are kids being kids that result in certain situations, right? Like, like one that you see with young kids that we see quite, that we were seeing not frequently, but you would see that were problematic cases were kids who had played with fire and they inadvertently started a fire that created a lot of damage. And it creates this system of like, oh, we're gonna solve all of this through restitution with thousands of dollars to a 10 year old child, which really just sets a victim up to be frustrated if there is a victim in that situation, right? To be frustrated with the system and all sorts of stuff and just creates and perpetuates the idea that the criminal justice system is something different to our society than what it really is. I wanna just tag on to that too, Pam. Sorry if I can, Melissa, um, you're, you're spot on. I mean, it, it's just, how do we actually like break the lens? You know what I mean? Like break this framework, this criminal justice framework for some of these behaviors. Um, I think of a young man, uh, a young boy, I should say, <clears throat> he was a 10 year old and he stole uh, like a big, like a water truck and he drove it, um, which was incredible that he could drive this big vehicle. Um, and, you know, he was a post-adopt youth. He had significant trauma history. He had, you know, autism. He had all these other needs. And so, like, it, it's just trying to, like, literally kind of intervene, and whether it's through, like, hardline policy constraints, or obviously it's going to take philosophical change and alignment, too, to say, no, we got to treat kids like kids. Stop using this framework, you know, this criminal framework. Because um, anyone who saw that case, you know, they're asking and they're saying, ah, oh, geez, you know, what's going on and, and, and how can we help? But it's already kind of coming to that framework like Pam said of, well, we use courtrooms and jail cells to respond to these problems. And it's just like, uh, no, you know, let's, let's continue to show, you know, obviously through the research, um, but linking it to kind of these anecdotal um, experiences as well of, of trying to help, help policymakers, maybe that's going beyond in some other questions, but helping them see and understand um, what it is we're talking about, who we're talking about, how they see these kids. Because um, I think you can find that philosophical alignment, but it will take that to, to try to kind of break that framework. If, if I may add, I, I absolutely agree. You know, Kent and, and Thomas, I see your comment. You articulated so well what this does to an individual and to community. And, and, and Pam and Brett, what I hear you saying, I, I completely agree with the just our justice system response. It robs children and communities of the help that they really need that will help them get on track and succeed. So what Kent was uh, talking about, you know, it became part of our culture, it became part of our norm. Um, well, what if the norm was I'm going to go to the education system with this need. I'm going to go to my pediatrician with this need and they're going to work with me and help me figure it out so that I can succeed. The mother feels like she can do that. That So we're, we're basically, we as in pediatrician, the field of health society, we're hiding behind the justice system and failing to help these children. That, that's great. Thank you to all of you. Um, that kind of leads into another question then, like what are some good alternatives to the justice system? And 
we know for many of the kids, the alternative are just their families, their young children that maybe misbehave at school or something like that. Um, are there other, you know, alternatives as well? If there's, you know, a child that needs some other kind of substantial help, what are, um, what could you recommend? Uh, Brett, that's you. You're reinvesting all sorts of dollars up front. <laughs> Again, sorry, go ahead, Kent. I, did, I didn't mean to get you off Kent. I'll let Laura go. And then I'll oh. <laughs> Whoever, it looks like there's just a bunch of well, people ready to okay. roll. Okay, I'm just going to put a plug in for social work. Um, you know, I've been a social worker for 30 years um, and a social work professor. I started my career working at group homes. Um, but I think it's it would be a misnomer to say anything, any one profession is the answer. Um, and maybe that's been a fault of our, you know, our professional organizations, right? Of, okay, social work's the answer or probation or pediatrics, because what we haven't really done and what I've come to see over many, many years uh, in the field is is put the investment in community to strengthen communities. So um, even when you bring a child to a social worker, which they might necessarily need, it doesn't mean that um, they're not gonna be, uh, you know, subject to then being system involved or regulated through systems. So I think there has to be a real balance um, the reinvestment in community is very, very important if we shrink probation and policing dollars, which is key. But then funneling the kids that actually need services to get help rather than just a blanket statement of, oh, you need child welfare or social work type of services, which can also have a labeling and a traumatic effect. So that's kind of my evolution of my thinking in that regard. I would also like to add, um, Laura just emphasized funneling the children who need services. And I think there are a lot of children who do need help, but we also need to call out the aspect of racism. So some of these kids are, um, I think Pam, you said it, exhibiting normal child behavior. So that piece of it has to completely end. And then we have to figure out who are the kids that need help? What help do they need? Be it investment in the community, supporting the families, health system, education system, sometimes child welfare. Those seem to be the most important pieces. Yeah, I'll, I'll add very quick and I'll let you Brett. Sorry about that. Uh, so I would say that I think uh, the, what we definitely need to do is to create an alternative to pro the probation systems uh, in every county, in every state because I feel like that's the main thing that is driving our kids into in being incarcerated and uh, all of that, right? So I think that uh, uh, that's definitely what we need to do. In to, that's what we need to start, right? How do we reform our probation departments and basically change that? Because I think that that's what's the web to the criminal justice system for our young people. But uh, as far as uh, attorneys, I think another thing that we need to do is um, uh, we need to expand the definition of what the youth diversion and development mean because I feel like right now in LA County, for example, there's many organizations that provide a lot of great services for a lot of people. And if there was more money, more reinvestment to them, they can probably scale it out even more and be even more effective, you know? So, and, but however, this money goes to probation. So it's a, it's a definitely a reinvestment issue, but I think also like, how do we make it where Right now, you know, in LA County, we have a youth diversion and development department that does some type of diversion, but, you know, it's not, uh, we could be better, right, by expanding the definition, you know, uh, there's a lot of organizations, like I said, that provide great services, but they don't qualify or don't file or don't consider, they don't, they're not categorized as youth diversion or development uh, organizations, so they can apply or serve these youth the way we would want them to, right, because they're not under that umbrella, so we need to expand that infrastructure. And then uh, at the same time, you know, really, uh, I worked uh, as a consultant of the Burns Institute in LA County on a report called the Youth Justice Reimagined, where we basically look at how to, how LA County can move all of its youth from the probation department into a completely new model, which is based on principles of youth development, 
uh, first care, you know, all those things that are not like provision. And one of the, some of the recommendations that came out of the report, it's uh, that we wanted to create a, a basically establish a department of youth direction, uh, an official department that can start, you know, really expanding th that definition and expanding its, uh, its services and also creating a, 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 a safe and secure healing centers in the communities 24 hours that can be accessible to people. And also another thing, there's a lot of things that, that I could name, but another one is the, the youth empowerment teams, basically just teams. And these are basically a group of people from the community made up of a lot of people that can, as soon as a youth gets incarcerated or it's in touch with the law enforcement, they are in the entire, uh, following the youth's journey in this yes. model and helping to determine what that youth actually needs versus uh, just put him in jail. And this is, uh, so it's like, those are the types of things that we need, we need to be looking in, looking into different alternatives to what provision currently does uh, and, and just uh, expanding that. And, and, and obviously it's, it's a reinvestment thing. We really need to get more money into the community. Uh, too much money goes into probation, into the systems. Uh, and we just really need to get that money back into the communities and start investing in the real issues. Uh, and when we talk about public safety, we really want to address the issues, uh, especially for those kids that commit the most serious crimes. You don't put them in cells. You actually look into why they're doing these things by helping them. And I think that the system does it the wrong way where commit the worst crimes, put them in the worst place versus commit the worst crimes, let's support them and figure out why they're doing those things. And so they don't do that again. So, so um, I love this, this conversation um, around these kind of alternative concepts and thoughts. Um, you know, one thing that, that we've been really, we've been putting a bunch of money into, and, and it starts with, again, it starts with that, you need that philosophical alignment with policymakers, with agency heads, with advocacy groups, and then you've got to look at, so philosophically, you get on the same page, you then start putting in some policies, um, but then really shifting your practice. Um, for Utah, part of that, you know, that reinvestment mechanism, we formalized it, we created a reinvestment fund, we cap where we can capture and identify, you know, funding that, that, that is d directly gained by a reduction in out-of-home placements, but then, you know, it only can be reinvested into non-residential effort as it were. Um, now, it's, you know, often the systems get way too formal, and, and I'm actually getting pretty tired of hearing about the latest evidence-based program. Like, show me some more informal um, supports. Like, that's what I am hungry for, you know, this continual approach. Um, so for us, though, from the system side, so in the last couple of years, I, I've shifted, I have over 100 staff now statewide that work in all voluntary preventative services. Um, this is pre-court, there's no, there's, there's like kind of a no wrong door approach to it um, because we very specifically, you know, we recognize there's a reality. The reality is we have used court systems to obtain services, some of these formal services. We've used detentions as the doorways. We all recognize what it was built out of. We recognize it's wrong. We're recognizing this shift. And so as we say, okay, we're gonna close those doorways. How do you be responsive and then say, okay, here's what we'll do differently. Here's how we'll navigate that. So if you're for schools, for example, no, you're not going to be able to refer a kid to court for truancy anymore. However, you know, let's partner with the schools. Here's these, you know, menu of resources, you know, and, and really primarily, I think it, it's, it's continuing to create opportunities from the formal perspective of more kind of front end um, navigation, I think, you know, maybe case management, but, but probably even less intense than that. Um, but on the very front end of the system, um, and then really key to that navigation being those informal supports. And, and so we're actually trying to turn that now and, and you know, and it, it creates great, wonderful problems, you know, in our system, because we still have the deep end. Um, but, but I, now I've got this great problem. I mean, all my staff, you know, they, they would rather work on the very front, they'd rather work with kids and their families and their communities. Um, but we still have, you know, this other need. So that's how we're able to start doing it. And, it, and it's, it's, it's been exciting um, and there's a lot of work to do. Great. Um, I see this has generated a lot of questions. So I'm just gonna um, ask you all some of those. Let me pull these up. Um, one question somebody had is whether, if there's anyone that could address how state legislatures may be working to either abet justice system involvement for young children 
or prevent that involvement. And she said she's thinking specifically of state laws addressing school truancy. I'm not sure if anyone has. Um, well, in, um, in Utah, like Brett said, we several years ago did a huge omnibus re reform bill that um, prohibited the, the reliance of the court system for truancy intervention. So it said that basically truancy couldn't be sent to the court system. And the schools pushed back. I mean, it, it's fascinating to me at such a huge bill. I see the question in there also about the front end versus the back end, like with LWAP and, and mandatory sentencing schemes and things like that. But with such a huge bill that touched basically every part of our system, some of the biggest struggle was over the truancy piece and getting the schools to really engage in interacting with kids in a different way. So um, while we prohibited the use of truancy to the court system, they're bas it basically created a sunset clause where it's like it gave them so much time to implement that. Um, it put some extra steps in place to say that um, they had to do like these other interventions first and things like that, that um, make it harder for them to be able to refer. Um, and so I think that I think that the thing is, is that I at least in Utah, there's a lot of really good policy conversations at the state legislature. Like when we brought this issue of raising or creating a minimum age or a floor, um, you know, our legislature was very, very receptive to that. But it's always the what if. It's always the like, but what about this one case? But what about this one case? And I think that was this point is so spot on, right? Like the the point of the the difference between the kids that maybe come to the attention of someone versus the kids that actually need some type of intervention, whether it's an informal support or an actual intervention, right? And um, I think that that is still where there is so much struggle, that even when you move to the policy point of like, how should we be treating children like children and separating out those, those lines, you still are really struggling with um, oh, but let's create like a carve out for this one particular population or let's create a carve out for this one situation. Um, and I think that's where the struggle is, is again, separating out the court doesn't have to be the answer to everything. It's okay to draw a hard line that just says, no, court is not a solution in this situation. No, no carve outs, no, 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 no exceptions, no nothing, find a different alternative. And I think that's where the push, um, like we've made a ton of progress in our state. I think drawing that really, really hard line is still a struggle. And I think it's a struggle, for, I would assume for everyone, but it has been even in our state where we've had a lot of successes with a lot of those conversations. Okay, thanks, Pam. Um, another question was, uh, this person says, I love the idea of an alternative to the probation system. Are there any models out there? What should this look like? And I think, Kent, you talked a little about that. I don't know if um, anyone else or Kent, do you have further ideas on any specific models? Uh, I think I posted a link. If y'all look at the link that I posted in that link, there's a, that's basically, uh, it has a, several recommendations and a lot of good information on uh, what we think can be a potential good model in LA County. You know, thinking about, uh, we, we looked at, uh, we did a lot of things to come up with this report. We did learning exchanges, learn from people from other places that are doing similar work that are working. Uh, uh, so there's that. Uh, and there's, uh, we also engage a lot of youth uh, in this process. So we can, you, uh, this is a, a report that was centered by Youth Voices as well. So I would say looking at to that report and maybe you could get a good concept of it. It still hasn't been, in LA County, we still haven't put it in place. It's still, you know, we still have probation, you know, but it is, uh, we are trying to push it, uh, forward to, you know, making it uh, something real, real. But uh, yeah, there. I don't think there is an actual model right now, but I think there's potential to get in there uh, if we get the right support around it. But uh, yeah, I hope that was a good answer. You know, can I just briefly was looking at the link that you posted while you, you were earlier mm -hmm. when you first posted it. And I think one of the things that's so great about that mm -hmm. is the, the issue or my frustration with probation is it's handing a list. Um, and I think someone used the word surveillance earlier, right? Like, I mean, it's handing a list to kids saying, oh, you need to go do these mm -hmm. things now, but it's not actually providing any support or how do you do that? Or how do you execute the thinking for doing that? Or what do you do when you come into a hurdle about, I don't know how to get it done. And so, you know, like providing support for a young person in 
like to navigate that. That's what there really is a big miss. There is a big disconnect, yeah. I think, is between, um, oh, we're helping and we're providing services to families or to kids, but we're not providing any tools for navigating it. Yeah. And I would just add to that a good point that uh, I think another thing that kept coming up, that, I mean, I'm pretty sure it's obvious everywhere that probation, everything that everything that the CBOs are doing to support youth when they come home, that those responsibilities should be probation responsibilities. That's what they get all that money. That's what every year they get millions of dollars to do all those things, to write bus passes, to connect the youth to uh, reentry programs, to do all these things. And they don't even do those things, but yet they're getting that money. So it's like, and now you have all these CBOs, some of them less than a five, less, their budgets are so small, some big, like doing all these things, right? Not being funded the same way, but, you know, and relying on funders and private funders. So it's like, I feel like that's the challenge too, you know, that you have, uh, they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that's why, you know, if we could figure out a system and infrastructure in the counties where everybody can support each other and, and you know, I think that's what we need, like a real, if you could put all the CBOs in the counties in, I said, one organization, right? Like, how can you create a, a network where the county is helping to facilitate this? Thing? Well, it's not helping like that, but it's really like, there's a real network of youth development support all around across. I think that's what we need. And probation is basically not doing their job. They're just pocketing their money, putting on salaries and benefits. And at least that's what I'm speaking on LA County. If y'all don't know in LA County, we have the largest probation department, the largest budget, uh, they have the largest budget. I'm assuming that all other counties and other states and probably the whole world. And why is it that, like that? Is because you know there's no accountability, there's no transparency, and you know, because the community was not awake, and now we are, and now now we're moving to the right direction. But I think that they're not doing their job. CBOs are doing it, and they're limited on the money and limited on their capacity. But yet they're still getting it done. So imagine if you had more money to them, you probably could see a, a, a big uh, shift on how we treat our youth in the county. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna hopefully get back to our audience questions. I wanna make sure we cover a little bit of advocacy campaigns around this issue. And I know um, you've all worked in, in one way or another on advocacy to raise the age. Um, I wanted to start uh, with uh, Pam and Brett. Uh, if you could talk a little about, um, especially uh, uh, it's a little maybe more unusual that in Utah, uh, the head of the Department of Juvenile Services was very involved in that campaign to raise the age. So how did that come about and how did you work together to you know, make that happen? Right, you want to start? Uh, sure. So, so I always, I, for context, like very quickly and high level, um, I think it really helps that, you know, we've had this great, we have a good little group of um, partners, I guess would be the term, um, that are, you know, kind of consistently at the table on these conversations um, and, and have been engaged in some real heavy, you know, big lifts of juvenile reform more broadly. So, so that when I, you know, when I start seeing, say, an issue like this, which is literally just, you know, it comes up sometimes anecdotally, you know, like, gosh, I just saw an 11 year old in one of my facilities, um, or we're seeing this, you know, those kind of things just literally just it starts as simple as it gets is you know calling I'm calling Pam and calling a few others and start kind of brainstorming um, and then just starting to look at kind of the data um, and and seeing okay you know this isn't a huge population but here's the numbers that you do have in Utah that are consistently being referred there is the disproportionate um, you know racial ethnic disparity in that number these are kids who have typically um, you know some type of a disability as well um, and so starting to kind of piece those things together and then just, you know, start looking for your champions. Um, from my perspective, and then I'll, I'll turn to Pam, I, I can definitely say that I probably walked into this conversation a, a little more, not naive is not the right word, but just assuming, well, God, this is common sense. You know, what the heck are we doing? You know, and I, I used this story when I was talking on a prep call. I remember sitting with the, the board of judges and saying, you know, and, and the, some of the judges saying, yeah, you know, it's we've always kind of wondered on mens rea for kids at this age, you know, and I'm just like, well, game over, then this is done. You know, this will be an easy walk in the park. And, but knowing there's still those little what if things in it, and it, it became, it was a tough, uh, we got it done in one session. Um, but it was, you know, we had some pretty fun uh, committee hearings um, 
that really, really had to walk through. And we really had to identify what those alternatives were going to be because people were, they were kind of like, again, they were philosophically maybe aligned that, okay, we should be treating kids differently, these young kids, but what does that really mean? What does that really mean? What are you going to do? So Pam, sorry, I'll probably talk too much there. No, I mean, I, I just have to give a huge, huge kudos to Brett here. I mean, how many people can say that in their state, the person who pushed and brought forward, found the sponsor for the legislation and everything was the director of their juvenile justice services. And that was Brett in this situation for us. And I think that, um, I mean, he found the legislator, he came to us, talked to me about what he thought the language should be and stuff. And so then we started playing with it and toying around with it. And, and I think, you know, I'm a defense attorney and who leads out on an issue matters. And the fact that, you know, I mean, it wasn't like, I mean, this was really like Brett came to everybody and was like, hey, let's let's talk about this. And I think the anecdotes that he's talking about, like being in there and seeing this 11 year old kid, he had his staff members come to the committee hearings and testify about what it was like to have a young person brought into the detention center and um, and the types of questions they asked. They made an infographic that told those stories. Um, and those types of things were very, very powerful to our legislature. And, um, and so um, where we got the pushback was, I think, from prosecutors and things like that. And that's where the committee hearings got a little bit lively and we had to uh, circle back around. But um, I think, you know, if you can partner, I mean, like Kent said earlier with the LA County report, to be able to have that youth voice to really give that perspective and other people to try and talk about what, what is it exactly that you mean? Like when Kent's talking about probation services, what exactly does probation services to a 10 year old look like? I mean, what what is that? You know, I mean, it, it, Brett's taught, had his folks come in and talk about what it was like to have a young person brought into the detention center. But even for kids who aren't booked into the detention center, but are formally referred to the court, what is the judge supposed to do with a 10 year old? I mean, if we really think that through, what is the court order for that? What is the, the solution for those types of things? And so when you can really start to um, help people understand, you're talking to a kid about, do you admit or deny that this is a misdemeanor, but could be, would be a misdemeanor if an adult, blah, 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 and all this other stuff. And then, you know, the response is, when is recess? Those are the types of things that bring it home to people to help them understand what, what exactly are we talking about? And I think it's just um, how much can you continue to bring it back to a common sense argument, particularly with something like this. Thank you. Um, I wanted to have a chance for Liz and uh, Dr. Barnard and uh, Dr. Abrams to talk a little about um, I know you use your scientific research to help in the campaign in California. So what were some of the ways, you know, that that was utilized? Sure. Um, well, we, we, it was interesting because we stumbled across this issue and decided to do some research while we worked with community-based organizations, um, simultaneously to feed them data and information that would help with advocacy. advocacy. Um, in California, there was a two-year process for the bill, um, and it was carried over from one legislation session you know, to the next year because there wasn't necessarily enough support, um, and there was some things to work out. One thing that I think we learned um, was that while you know data and and numbers and and the you know the research that we did helped to feed information to advocates and to legislators um it's really was the advocates and the community members from arc and children's fence fund and other groups that were able to get this on the table along with then Senator State Senator Holly Mitchell's office. Um, you know, uh, and so the partnership was key for us. So we learned that. Um, and being able to answer the question, the then what question was somewhat important, but in the spectrum of other reforms that were happening, um, and someone asked a question about that. Um, this was also at a time when we were raising the age of being tried as an adult, 
uh, Miranda rights for youth. So there was kind of a, it was packaged with other juvenile justice and youth justice reform bills. It was kind of packaged in a group of bills. I'll let Liz add any lessons learned here. <laughs> I think that's a good summary. It's it's um it's also striking how similar the process was in some ways to what Brett and Pam described. It was the sort of collective recognition of these kids are too young, this is not right. And then the next step was looking at the data, which Laura and I did formally through a university with an IRB, you know, formal use university of approval for research. And we quantified how many kids are we talking about? And then we gave that those numbers back to the lawmakers. Um, and then I think things kind of bifurcated. It was us doing research, like I showed you guys the national study, so to so that the governor could have something to read, objective research. We did not cheat on the results. Um, and then also separately from our role as researchers and university professors, standing up as advocates, both as individual citizens, but also members of professional groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics, for example, was able to provide letters of support, things like that. Um, and it was a tremendous amount of hard work from the advocates like ARC um, that then brought community members to the Capitol to testify um, and they worked really hard with the Senator um, Holly Mitchell, who's incredible um, to move this forward. Thank you. And so we'll, I'm going to end with you, Kent, on your perspective as a community advocate on, you know, what were some of the key elements to, to help you get this passed? Yeah, um, I think it will basically, honestly, like what, what something that we're very, that we do at ARC at anti reservism Coalition that we believe in is changing hearts and minds through storytelling. Uh, you know, we could have the data, we could have all that, we have to have that, but when we go to this meeting with legislators or county officials or anybody, what really moves them, what really end, ends up getting the extra vote that we need at the center and the assembly or in the, at the board of supervisors is literally the stories. You know, once you bring the youth and the people that live this experience on top of the data and all that, right? You have to have the turn, you have to have all that. But once you bring the real data, which is the life experience in front of the people's faces, you can't deny those experiences. And it's hard to you know, turn away and pretend that it's not there once you already heard it. So I think that that really was one of the key strategies to it. Uh, and even when, once it got passed, uh, even in LA County, we immediately, uh, there was a motion in LA County where, to implement it locally, the, 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 the bill. So we wanted to follow right away because, you know, it's, it, it could be a lot, but that doesn't mean that the county will enforce it and push for it, right? So one thing that we also ensured that we did in LA County is that once it passed, we went to the board supervisors with other partners that helped get it and it got into a motion and we got, a, got it passed like as a local motion saying that, hey, we need to make sure that this is now the county law as well. Yeah. So I guess it would just be like, honestly, whenever we're doing anything, any issue, just bring the stories to the people. And over time, maybe this year, that senator, that assembly member might not vote the way you want to, but maybe to next year or the year after he will because the stories are in his mind and are bothering him. So that's what you hope you do, right? Change his heart and mind. So I think that's the main thing, just storytelling. Let the people that have experienced these issues speak and you back them up and let's hope that we get the right results after. Great, thank you. Um, we have one question we didn't get to. I'll see in a minute if we can answer it um, kind of long. Uh, this person says, well, I can see entirely the advantages of setting a minimum age. Are the tiny steps like ending life without parole, mandatory bind over, et cetera, a boon to ending incarceration or a hindrance? There's an unclear hazy spot between chiseling away reform and advocating for full decarceration. I don't know if anybody wants to tackle that one. I can just answer that with respect to the minimum age. So um, we have found that these hard lines really do matter. Um, it's important we've learned working with the advocates in our research not to set them too low. So six is too low, 10 is too low, and you can do more harm than good by setting it too low. But um, a minimum age that's consistent with the United Nations recommendations, um, that is decarceration for younger children. And it, it really does make a difference. It, breaks that criminal justice framework that Brett was talking about in the words that Pam used. It's about treating children like children and it changes 
hard lines for all of the children that they're then excluded. Um, but it also changes the paradigm for how children above that age threshold are thought about and the service pathways that are available for them. Great. And um, one last question that came in is, can you elaborate on what harms are done by setting the age too low? So what we heard from our interviewees is that there can be legal protections in place, but there's uneven implementation of it. So if you have a minimum age of six, for example, or let's say eight, it will signal to a judge that, you know, if an eight-year-old does something, um, it's okay for them to be in jail or juvenile hall because, you know, we have this minimum age of eight. So it puts everybody just above the, that age threshold, um, more at risk of justice involvement is kind of the, what we were hearing from our interviewees. Um, I know we're out of mm -hmm. time. Uh, I'll just add to that. Um, it's not just that, you know, again, eight, nine, 10 year olds, you really don't see in juvenile hall very often. Okay. That's, we're not really, we're talking less about incarceration and, and more about net widening. So what a lower age does is it widens the net of family regulation and probation surveillance of young people in a way that casts a wider swath of those who are going to be labeled and harmed by the juvenile justice system, who are more likely to be black and brown than white at alarming rates and sets a pathway toward negative outcomes. So I would say the, the real harm is in, in expanding the net of the carceral state so to speak. Um, so in that sense, limiting, limiting the carceral continuum with these laws is a road toward abolition. It's not full abolition, but it is a way to shrink the regulatory function of the state with these younger children in response to that question. Thank you. Well, I think we could all talk for another hour, but I want to be mindful of everybody's time. <laughs> so um, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, you were wonderful, and I um, really appreciate it. And I, I'm sure everybody uh, got a lot out of this. So thank you again, and uh, have a wonderful day to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.